I am honored and grateful to have been asked to give this inaugural lecture honoring a man who has opened doors to savagery for thousands of people. It is now more than 40 years since we met in Los Angeles, where Mangesh was doing his PhD in linguistics. And we used to meet at my home every Friday and read Savitri together. Those early days for all of us, young people, for we were contemporaries, absorbing the writings of Sri Aurobindo and Mother, living in the sanctified atmosphere of the center, the first center devoted to Mother and Sri Aurobindo in America, with all the photos, the books, and the teachings so beautifully conveyed by Jyoti Priya, Dr. Judith Tyberg, and surrounded by many souls seeking enlightenment, were filled with joy and light and love. As I began to read Savitri, and now nearly 50 years have passed, I found the lines flowing into me as a stream. And after some months, I recited one evening for Jyoti Priya and assembled devotees the first three cantos of Book One by heart. I found that the mantric lines came into the soul without the intervention of the mind. And even at the age of 22, there seemed to be an inner comprehension that transcended thought. In this, our age of difficulty and promise, of the last gap, gasp of the dark forces, and their attempts to destabilize the world through terrorism and power, we have the constant help, guidance, and protection of the mother and Sri Aurobindo. And we have Savitri, the way of love. Because this memorial lecture series is so important, continuing the great work and tradition of Savitri Bhavan, today I will share with you some very special remembrances from disciples who have offered lights and insights I have never heard before. These I will conclude the end of this talk. Savitri is divine love manifested on earth. Savitri is sacred. Two cantos have the word love in their title. There's the book of love, book five, and the debate of love and death, book 10, canto three. For me, I read the author's note frequently. Sri Aurobindo felt it important to include this at the beginning of Savitri. And he speaks of each of the characters. Sachavan, the soul carrying the divine truth of being within itself, but descended into the grip of death and ignorance. Savitri, the divine word, daughter of the sun, goddess of the supreme truth, who comes down and is born to save. Ashwapati, the lord of the horse, her human father, is the lord of tapasya. The concentrated energy of spiritual endeavor that helps us to rise from the mortal to the immortal plains. Jumatsena. Lord of the shining hosts, father of Sachivan is the divine mind, here fallen blind, losing its celestial kingdom of vision, and through that loss, its kingdom of glory. And now, this most important section, where Sri Aurobindo says, still, this is not mere allegory. 
The characters are not personified qualities, but incarnations or emanations of living and conscious forces with whom we can enter into concrete touch. And they take human bodies in order to help man and show him the way from his mortal state to a divine consciousness and immortal life. When Mother gave me her blessings to be the first to read Savitri in Oroville, I did so each Wednesday for more than 10 years in the Matrimandia Gardens nursery and then in the small meditation room in the workers' camp. I went deeper and deeper into the poem, understanding so little with the mind. For who can understand experiences that only Sri Aurobindo had among all the sages and seers the earth has known? His love and his sacrifice for us is beyond our comprehension, and the least we can do is kneel down in gratitude before him. Of all the greatest works of poets and sages, the Mahabharata, the Ramayana, the Odyssey, the Iliad, the greatest works of Shakespeare, and the overhead touches Sri Aurobindo points out in his letter on poetry, Savitri stands alone as the greatest work in all the languages of the world, for it is mantra, the power of the word. Now let us look further into the theme of love I have chosen for my talk. We first read of Savitri in Canto I of Book I, on page 6, and we find that life denies her gifts. A narrow movement on time's deep abysm. Life's fragile littleness denied the power, the proud and conscious wideness, and the bliss she had brought with her into the human form. The calm delight that weds one soul to all, the key to the flaming doors of ecstasy. Earth's grain that needs the sap of pleasure and tears, rejected the undying rapture's boon, offered to the daughter of infinity, her passion flower of love and doom she gave. In vain now seemed the splendid sacrifice. A prodigal of her rich divinity, herself and all she was she had lent to men, hoping her greater being to implant and in their bodies' lives acclimatize that heaven might native grow on mortal soil. Men and earth have long rejected the divine love. In Canto II of Book I, we have the first description of Savitri in lines that K.D. Sertna, whom we know as Amal Kiran, considered the highest and greatest of all the lines in Savitri. In fact, I believe he terms it the nec plus ultra, that of which there is nothing higher. Here we experience a passage so profound, so beautiful, and so filled with love that only Sri Aurobindo could have written it. As in a mystic and dynamic dance, a priestess of immaculate ecstasies, inspired and ruled 
from truth's revealing vault, moves in some prophet cavern of the gods, a heart of silence in the hands of joy, inhabited with rich creative beats, a body like a parable of dawn that seemed a niche for gold divinity or golden temple door to things beyond. Immortal rhythms swayed in her time-born steps. Her look, her smile, awoke celestial sense, even in earth stuff. And their intense delight poured a supernal beauty on men's lives. A wide self-giving was her native act. A magnanimity as of sea or sky enveloped with its greatness all that came and gave a sense as of a greatened world. Her kindly care was a sweet, temperate sun. Her high passion, a blue heaven's equipoise. As might a soul fly like a hunted bird, escaping with tired wings from a world of storms, and a quiet reach like a remembered breast, in a haven of safety and splendid soft repose, one could drink life back in streams of honey fire, recover the lost habit of happiness, feel her bright nature's glorious ambience and preen joy in her warmth and colors rule. A deep of compassion, a hushed sanctuary, her inward help unbarred a gate in heaven. Love in her was wider than the universe. The whole world could take refuge in her single heart. And then we read again, apart, living within, all lives she bore, aloof she carried in herself the world. Her dread was one with the great cosmic dread. Her strength was founded on the cosmic mights. The universal mother's love was hers. And this, is only the beginning in a poem of nearly 24,000 lines. In the second canto, we begin to learn more of Savitri, her will and her work for the earth. And we are again lifted by lines that speak to us of love. as in a many-hued, flaming inner dawn. Her life's broad highways and its sweet bypaths lay mapped to her sun-clear recording view from the bright country of her childhood's days and the blue mountains of her soaring youth and the paradise groves and peacock wings of love to joy clutched under the silent shadow of doom in a last turn where heaven raced with hell. We read all that Savitri has to conquer and to face. On the bare peak where self is alone with naught. And life has no sense and love no place to stand. She must plead her case upon extinction's verge. In the world's death cave, uphold life's helpless claim and vindicate her right to be and love. Then in Canto Three, we are introduced to Ashupati in the yoga of the king 
the yoga of the soul's release. The Supreme's gaze looked out through human eyes and saw all things and creatures as itself and knew all thought and word as its own voice. There, unity is too close for search and clasp, and love is a yearning of the one for the one, and beauty is the sweet difference of the same, and oneness is the soul of multitude. Again, the theme of love. In Canto 4, the secret knowledge, a canto that I cannot read enough, often enough. There's so much in this canto. Many of you will know these lines. In moments when the inner lamps are lit, and the life's cherished guests are left outside. Our spirit sits alone and speaks to its gulfs. A wider consciousness opens then its doors. Invading from spiritual silences, a ray of the timeless glory stoops a while to commune with our seized, illumined clay and leaves its huge white stamp upon our lives. In the oblivious field of mortal mind, revealed to the closed prophet eyes of trance or in some deep, internal solitude, witnessed by a strange, immaterial sense, the signals of eternity appear. The truth mind could not know unveils its face. We hear what mortal ears have never heard. We feel what earthly sense has never felt. We love what common hearts repel and dread. Our minds hush to a bright omniscient. A voice calls from the chambers of the soul. We meet the ecstasy of the Godhead's touch in golden privacies of immortal fire. These signs are native to a larger self that lives within us by ourselves unseen. Only sometimes a holier influence comes. A tide of mightier surgings bears our lives and a diviner presence moves the soul. In book two, the book of the traveler of the worlds, Canto two, the kingdom of subtle matter, a passage ends with the words love and sweetness. I have been told that sweetness was Sri Aurobindo's favorite word. And indeed, it occurs in more than 80 lines of Savitri. Interestingly, it is well known that it was also Shakespeare's favorite word. On every plane, the hieratic power, initiate of unspoken verities, dreams to transcribe and make a part of life, in its own native style and living tongue, some trait 
of the perfection of the unborn, some vision seen in the omniscient light, some far tone of the immortal rhapsodist voice, some rapture of the all-creating bliss, some form and plan of the beauty unutterable. Worlds are there nearer to those absolute realms, where the response to truth is swift and sure, and spirit is not hampered by its frame, and hearts by sharp division seized and rent. And delight and beauty are inhabitants, and love and sweetness are the law of life. Friends, Mangesh loved Savitri and so many of us in this sacred place that is filled with the force and grace of the mother. We can feel the presence. For me, Savitri is the way, and love shall guide us, inspire us, heal us, and one day transform us. Thus we draw near to the all-wonderful, following his rapture in things as sign and guide. Beauty is his footprint, showing us where he has passed. Love is his heartbeat's rhythm in mortal breasts. Happiness, the smile on his adorable face. In book two, the book of the traveler of the worlds. A book that contains passages that resonate in the depths of the soul. And even though there are sections that are very difficult to read, experiences Sasrapati goes through in the descent of night, in descent into night. Here are lines from Canto three, the glory and the fall of life. Creation leapt straight from the hands of God. Marvel and rapture wandered in the ways. Only to be was a supreme delight. Life was a happy laughter of the soul. And joy was king with love for minister. And a few pages on the line, a flood of universal love and peace. On Tuesday evenings at Savitri Bhavan and Friday evenings in the ashram school, during the Om Choir, I read passages from Savitri. And we are lifted far above ourselves into realms where the new music can descend in human bodies and threw them into the earth. A music of healing and transformation, a music of love for and from the divine. Even in the very difficult canto, the world of falsehood, the mother of evil, and the sons of darkness, Sri Aurobindo speaks to us of love. He imposed upon dark atom and dumb mass the diamond script of the imperishable, inscribed on the dim heart of fallen things a paean song of the free infinite and the name, foundation of eternity, and traced on the awake 
exultant cells, in the ideographs of the ineffable, the lyric of the love that waits through time, and the mystic volume of the book of bliss, and the message of the superconscient fire. Canto 11, the paradise of the life gods. Across the vibrant secrecies of space, a dim and happy music sweetly stole. Smitten by unseen hands, he heard heart close, the harp's cry of the heavenly minstrels pass, and voices of unearthly melody chanted the glory of eternal love in the white-blue moonbeam air of paradise. And just two pages on, in sudden moments of revealing flame, in passionate responses half unveiled, he reached the rim of ecstasies unknown, a touch supreme surprised his hurrying heart. The clasp was remembered of the wonderful, and hints leaped down of white beatitudes. Eternity drew close, disguised as love, and laid its hand upon the body of time. In the world soul, Canto 14, a fire of passion burned in spirit depths. The constant touch of sweetness linked all hearts. The throb of one adoration's single bliss in a rapt ether of undying love. In the last canto of book two, canto 15, the kingdoms of the greater knowledge, four lines. Here came the thought that passes beyond thought. Hear the still voice which our listening cannot hear. The knowledge by which the knower is the known, the love in which beloved and lover are one. And then we enter book three, the book of the D Divine Mother. And there is so much here on love. And I could go on for hours because I haven't even covered a portion of the lines that have love. But I'll continue with a few. A burning love from white spiritual founts annulled the sorrow of the ignorant depths. Suffering was lost in her immortal smile. which leads us to the passage that so many love and cherish, the description of the Divine Mother, beginning with, at the head she stands of birth and toil and fate, which I leave for you to listen to Mother's recitation with all the force, majesty, beauty, and power of the divine. I began a website in the year 2000, Savitri by Sri Aurobindo dot com, all one word, Savitri by Sri Aurobindo dot com. And if you have a computer, and I'm sure your children do, uh, 
you can hear Mother reading from Savitri. We have, we have posted everything, uploaded everything that Mother has read on Savitri. A bliss, a light, a power, a flame-white love, caught all into a soul immense embrace. Existence found its truth on oneness breast, and each became the self and space of all. O radiant fountain of the world's delight, world free and unattainable above, O bliss, whoever dwellst deep hid within, while men seek thee outside and never find, mystery and muse with hieratic tongue, Incarnate the white passion of thy force, mission to earth some living form of thee, one moment fill with thy eternity. Let thy infinity in one body live. All knowledge wrap one mind in seas of light, all love throb single in one human heart. All mights and greatnesses shall join in her. Beauty shall walk celestial on the earth. Delight shall sleep in the cloud net of her hair. And in her body, as on his homing tree, immortal love shall beat his glorious wings. the splendid yoke of her beauty and her love. And again, O living inscription of the beauty of love, missiled in aureate virginity, what message of heavenly strength and bliss in thee is written with the eternal's sun-white script, one shall discover and greaten with it his life to whom thou loosenest thy heart's jeweled strings. O oh, rubies of silence, lips from which there stole low laughter, music of tranquility, star lustrous eyes awake in sweet large night, and limbs like fine-linked poems made of gold, stanzaed to glimmering curves by artist gods, depart where love and destiny call your charm. Venture through the deep world to find thy mate, for somewhere on the longing breast of earth, thy unknown lover, waits for thee, the unknown. Thy soul has strength and needs no other guide than one who burns within thy bosom's powers. There shall draw near to meet thy approaching, approaching steps the second self for whom thy nature asks. He who shall walk until thy body's end. A, a close bound traveler pacing with thy pace. The lyrist of thy soul's most intimate chords who shall give voice to what in thee 
is mute. And now we have only reached the Book of Love. In these great spirits, now incarnate here, love brought down power out of eternity to make of life his new undying base. And then a passage which maybe most of us know, having heard so many times, we cannot fail to wish to hear it again and again. On the dumb bosom of this oblivious globe, although as unknown beings we seem to meet, our lives are not aliens, nor as strangers join, moved to each other by a causeless force. The soul can recognize its answering soul across dividing time and on life's roads, absorbed, rapt traveler. Turning, it recovers familiar splendors in an unknown face. And touched by the warning finger of swift love, it thrills again to an immortal joy, wearing a mortal body for delight. There is a power within that knows beyond our knowings. We are greater than our thoughts, and sometimes earth unveils that vision here. To live, to love, are signs of infinite things. Love is a glory from eternity's spheres. And again, love dwells in us like an unopened flower, awaiting a rapid moment of the soul. He sang to them of the lotus heart of love with all its thousand luminous buds of truth which quivering sleeps veiled by apparent things. And Savitri's voice, let fate do with me what she will or can. I am stronger than death and greater than my fate. My love shall outlast the world. Doom falls from me, helpless against my immortality. And in the great debate with death. O oh death, who reasonest, I reason not. Reason that scans and breaks but cannot build, or builds in vain because she doubts her work. I am, I love, I see, I act, I will. Death surrounded her. Death answered her. One deep surrounding cry. Know also, knowing thou shalt cease to love and cease to will, delivered from thy heart, so shalt thou rest forever and be still, consenting to the impermanence of things. But Savitri replied for man to death. When I have loved forever, I shall know. Love in me knows the truth all changings mask. 
And I usually end with these words, but today it will be a little different. These are Savitri's last words. When a sage wonders at the great change that has occurred in her. Awakened to the meaning of my heart, that to feel love and oneness is to live. And this, the magic of our golden change, is all the truth I know or seek, O sage. I have had many elder guides, and Purani was one of them, Nolini was one of them, and I would like to share with you two things that Arbinda Basu told me recently about Savitri. And one of them, I'm sure he will allow me, came from Nirod Baran, who told Arbinda that Sri Arbinda said, don't put anything on top of Savitri. It is my body. Another is from my dear friend and Sadika Sunanda, who cares for mother's treasures. She spoke to me of a copy of Savitri that she has, where mother has written in her own hand, to Savitri with love, mother. And this last is again from Arbinda, who told me this when Dilip Kumar Roy came to him with tears in his eyes and recounted this experience. Mother asked to see Dilip. And he said, I don't want to see her. So Nolini came to him. And in his way, he could be very strong. He said, that would be disrespectful. So Dilip came before mother. And she asked him one question. Why are we here? And he fumbled around uh, to do sadhana, to this, that. And very quietly, mother said, to please Sri Aurobindo. Dr. Father Donald Gorgon is a Jesuit priest and calls himself a Christian Aurobindonian. And in the 2003 Gaveshana, published by Arbinda Basu, he has written an article on the withdrawal of Sri Aurobindo and the resurrection of Jesus. I quote just a few lines. For Aurobindo has told me they had to pull him out of Sri Aurobindo's room. He was so deeply in trance. He writes, I first visited the ashram in 1966. Nin sorry, 1996, following an invitation issued long before by Aurobindo Basu. On that occasion, I also had the opportunity for a visit with Amal Kiran, a moving experience in itself. I was able to visit him again on my next visit to the ashram 
in October of 1999. In 1996, Sri Aurobindo appeared to me twice. Once in Pondicherry at the park guest house where I was staying, and once a few days later in Madras. I had no doubt about its being his presence. Sri Aurobindo lives. He did not die. Yet he was transformed, transported to another plane of existence, not out of contact with this world. He is still connected to this cosmos. Although his is a spiritual existence, I would not say that he is disembodied. His is a new way of being embodied. We may not call his withdrawal a resurrection, but are we not trying to articulate in available and human language an experiential and profound knowledge? And today, I will close with these five lines. From Savitri. My spirit has glimpsed the glory for which it came, the beating of one vast heart in the flame of things. My eternity clasped by his eternity and tireless of the sweet abysms of time, deep possibility always to love. I think you would wish me to say a big deep thank you to Narad on behalf of all of you for this beautiful journey through Savitri that he has shared with us with his own deep feeling. Thank you, Narad. We have here a friend from UK, Barnabai Ji Patel, also known as Avadhani. He's uh, recently brought out a book, Correspondences, Interviews and Conversations with Sri Aurobindo and the Mother. And he has a few copies with him, which he's willing to distribute if people would like to have them. Uh, would you come, Barnabai? Those of you who are interested can meet him here. Thank you all very, very much for coming and sharing the atmosphere of Savitri with us today. I hope this will be the first of many more meetings.